This is one of the biggest myths around what is clinical experience, what is not. Ask the Dean, episode 15. Hello, Rachel Grubbs, how are you? Hello, I'm well. Dr. Scott Wright. Howdy. The man of the hour. How's it going, Ryan? It's, it's going. I'm excited to jump in, answer some more questions for our mapped members yeah. here live, and then for everyone else later on YouTube and on uh, and on the podcast. So yeah, uh, that's the fun thing about creating this content is is everyone gets to benefit. But uh, yeah. you get to ask questions live if you're part of the mapped member community. Which, if you didn't know by now, you can sign up for a free two-week trial at mapped.com. So, yep. over 1,050 people on the, on the platform so far. And lots of stuff coming. Good, good planning meeting this morning to kind of lay out the next several months of, of stuff. So, Awesomeness. hopefully it goes well. Let's go and jump in and answer some questions. All right, here we go. Woohoo. Hi, everyone. As a non-traditional student, how do I select the list of activities for med school application? I certainly have more than what the app gives space for. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is a super common problem for the AMCAS application. TMDSAS yeah. doesn't limit, ACOMAS doesn't limit, but for AMCAS, 15 spots, period. And yeah. for non-trads, they're like, um, how am I supposed to fit my whole life into 15 spots? Yeah, this is a big issue, and and as you said with AMCAS, it it, it compounds what because I think even with AM with uh, TMDSAS and ACOMAS, I'm not sure I would recommend, even though there there's unlimited spots, recommend everything you know under the sun yep. uh, that you've done. And so, really, it's an issue I think with with all three platforms where you're trying to. Um, you know, be wise about what you put on there. And, and I think that's what you have to do. It's, it's like we've said before, in terms of your marketing of yourself, you know, when, when, a, when a corporation, let's say, for example, Coca-Cola or uh, McDonald's or Nike or whatever, in their advertisements, whether it's print advertisement or a commercial on television or a billboard, they don't put everything they could put about the product. In <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so I think the same thing goes for an applicant when they're, when they're doing their application and trying to craft uh, um, what they're going to include on there. I think you have to use the things that really communicate what you're wanting to communicate to the admissions committee. Uh, the things that give you the big, uh, big buck kind of, uh, exposure that you're looking for. So, you know, it may be something that you didn't do as much, but it represents something that you want to communicate, uh, whether that's your leadership abilities and talents or whether that's team building or your teamwork abilities, uh, whatever it is you're trying to communicate, your organizational skills, um, you want to get get the biggest bang for your buck when you're when you're uh, putting those activities on there, and so I think that that's where my feeling is that when you're beginning the application process, you need to have a good idea before you even start with your personal statement or start with your uh, actually filling out the application. You need to have a good idea of a list of ten to fifteen or whatever. Uh, qualities about yourself that you really want to communicate in the application so that then you're building off of that in everything you do uh, in this list of activities, in your personal statement, everything is going to center around those 10 to 15 qualities that you're trying to communicate. Uh, maybe it's that, maybe it's your interpersonal skills and, and your clinical experience has done that, but also your uh, time as a customer service manager for a, you know, company that you worked for or whatever, uh, maybe, you know, whatever. So I, I think that really focusing in on uh, the, the big dollar things that you're trying to communicate is the way to go. You don't want to um, do everything, obviously, uh, but you want to really get um, your message across. But as I just said, you have to know what that message is before you can begin crafting what, what that's going to be. So, um, so I think that that's, you know, the way to go. Uh, 
it, it, it makes the application more cohesive. It makes it more uh, uh, consistent mm -hmm. across, the, uh, across the application in terms of the various parts of the application. It really makes that uh, a, much, a much more smooth uh, communication tool when you're, when you're doing that. Yeah, I, I like that advice. I, I just, I, I hesitate because a lot of students will take that advice and then they go, okay, so m the goal that I'm supposed to write about is I need to just tell them how amazing I am at customer service, how amazing I am at interpersonal skills. And, and they, they focus more on selling those things than than just showing who they are through their writing. And, right. and, and they're focused on the overall like in the activity description if they have a, a customer service right they worked at the gap or, or wherever and and they talk about that and the the first line of of that description is my my uh interpersonal skills were honed during this time and then i'm just like no like i just want to know who you are don't don't just yeah. shove it down my throat right, there's an right, art right. to this as well right absolutely and and yeah I, I agree with that completely ryan it's very you know you have to be smart about it and you're really trying to show who you are but my my caution with that is some some applicants don't know who they are yep they're they're not real clear on and not as much non-traditional students. That, that's, I think, a deeper problem sometimes for younger students who are still trying to figure out what they're all about. Uh, Non-trads sometimes are a little bit more in, 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 um, in touch with uh, sort of who they are and, and, and in many cases with non-trads, who they want to be. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so I think you're right. It's a balancing act between, between the two things. But I, I think having a good sense of, of who you are is a, is a really important uh, thing to, to be intact with at the beginning so that you're not uh, just sort of all over the place in the application and there's no sort of connect the dots. Yeah. And, and again, just understanding, we've talked about this a bunch that your activities don't all have to center around healthcare, around medicine. Correct. You can put That's some of the jobs in there. Uh, I definitely recommend putting a hobby in there just to show oh, uh, yeah. again who you are outside Absolutely. of everything else. Um, th those kinds of things are important too. Yeah, and when I used to interview students at uh, uh, for medical school, um, it was not unusual that that's what I would hone in on mm -hmm. uh, when in an interview. So I see that in their activity list that they play the you know the trumpet in the in some orchestra or in a jazz band or whatever. And I man, I want to talk all about the trumpet. Why did you choose the trumpet? Mm -hmm. You know, why did you, you know, what do you like about jazz? Or, you know, just I mean, that's where you get deep, rich conversations. And so I absolutely agree with that. You but but Scott, how do you learn if if that's all you want to talk about, how do you learn their their deep understanding of medical ethics? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I want to see that you can connect with me on a personal level. Yep. That's that's my chief goal. That's so. the goal. There we go. Rocking and rolling. Next yeah. up, thought on personal training for clinical experience. Ooh. Personal training. Yeah, so well, being like a personal trainer. I I, I, I have my answer. <laughs> As a former personal trainer, it's not not clinical experience. No, agreed. Yeah. I you know, I have a personal trainer myself. I was going to uh, say, like, you're looking a little buff over there. <laughs> uh, nah, I wish. Uh, I have been pretty consistent over the past two or three weeks, so which is a pretty big deal for me. But, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I don't think that uh, personal training is a clinical e exercise. It, it, now, it, what is, what, uh, just as we were just saying, uh, it's an amazing experience. Training? Oh, absolutely. So I think that this is something you would definitely want to put on the application. You want to put it on because of your commitment to, to your client uh, about what that does in their life and have the kind of commitment you have to have to them to, to show up on time and to really focus them and hold them accountable. And, and But the interpersonal qualities that are important in personal training Yep. Uh, the discipline that's involved, absolutely. I definitely be included, but not as uh, clinical yeah. experience. 
great, great communication skills, great interpersonal oh, yeah. skills, all of that. When, when I was a personal trainer before medical school, I, even during medical school, I was still working as a personal trainer. Like those, those days wore me out more than being a physician. Oh, sure. It just oh, sure. needing to switch personalities for every client and making sure that you're meeting their needs. It was, it was, it's hard work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great experience, but not clinical. And you kind of get cussed at sometimes. I used to cuss at my personal <laughs> trainer all the time. What do you mean seven reps? I counted eight. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> yeah. It's an inside secret. Personal trainers never keep count accurately. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. All right, next that up. As a non-trad, what if you have limited clinical experience due to working a full-time career? Yeah, we covered this one a lot. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, you do what you can do. And uh, I, I, I totally get uh, the difficulties that represented if you're a non-trad and you have a full-time job and maybe you've got a family and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're trying to go to school or you're studying for the MCAT or, you know, that you've got a lot going on. Even uh, even I a think, traditional student who comes from yeah. more of a disadvantaged background who has to yep. work to support themselves, support their family, is yeah. in the same spot potentially. No, absolutely, and and I think you do what you're what you're able to do. That's where you have to maximize your experiences. You have to maximize the value you get from those experiences as much as you can. So limited, you know, is it potentially going to impact your application? Yes, uh, you have to recognize that. Now, what I would say, and I've seen this before, where a student, you know, basically says, you know, I, I have all these things going on in my life. I have very limited time to be able to do clinical experiences or shadow or whatever, volunteer work. And uh, how do I deal with that in my application? And then I looked in their application and I found that they, they had 10 hours a week to wait left or they had 10 <laughs> hours a week to uh, to play in their rock and roll band or yep. whatever. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, so you got 10 hours a week to go play Frisbee golf, but you don't have 10 hours a week to go do clinical experience. How's that work? Yep. So I think you have to be careful with that and, and really uh, examine what is going on in my life and where, where, where are the priorities here at this time and, and what I'm trying to accomplish. And uh, you know, maybe it is that you're packed full and, Everything packed full is not allowing you time. But uh, I would say even if it's one or two hours a week, if you can get away to do anything uh, uh, that's clinically related, I think that that would be valuable. Uh, and again, with those limited hours, you got to really get the richness in there. You really have to see and be able to communicate to the uh, admissions committees. This is what um, the value of this experience, though limited, was for me. Yeah. So what? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I need to get a T-shirt with that. So I what? was just thinking that. I I still need to make shirts of our uh, of our um, values too. Yeah, absolutely. It's on my list. One of these days. Uh, hello, thank you for hosting this session today. You're welcome. Uh, I work as a caregiver in a nursing home. I help the residents with bathing, feeding, dressing, and sometimes taking vitals. Some of my peers told me this experience does not count as clinical experience since I'm not in a clinical setting and I'm not interacting with physicians. To me, this experience is very valuable and it has strengthened my passion for patient care. But I was wondering what medical schools will think since, uh, like my peer said, dot, dot, dot. This is one of the biggest myths around what is clinical experience, what is not. Yeah, I think, yeah. And, and I know we no, we've discussed indeed. it a little bit um, as well as this this notion that like you you need to be in a quote unquote certified healthcare facility with a, a, a specific ratio of three physicians to one patient to be considered a clinical experience. And it's just like. Yeah. Were you with someone who needs care and were you providing care? Yeah, absolutely. I see this as clinical experience. A thousand percent. Know. Yeah, it's, you know, you're interacting with patients, you're in a healthcare setting, uh, you're, you're doing things that are meaningful for that person. Uh, in my view, the so what here is big. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, there's a lot of potential here for a lot of great so what moments mm -hmm. uh, in, in this experience. So 
I don't agree with your peers or your friends who are saying, no, it's not clinical experience. Uh, I, I certainly would see it as clinical experience. Definitely. I agree. And that's fun. And, and MAPT will be able to give that feedback of uh, this this uh, nursing home. Like, I, I see nursing home in this experience. You didn't mark it as clinical. Did you mean to? <laughs> Eventually, with mapped, I got a C, or if I got a C in my calculus two class during my first semester in undergrad, is that a big deal to colleges, medical schools? I'm assuming it dropped to my GPA, and it is currently a three point seven three overall, three point five three for science uh, for AMCAS. Should I retake this course, or just leave it as it is? Ha! Struggling, <laughs> struggling with that three seven, Scott. Yeah, right. Oh my gosh. Bless bless your heart. Whoever you are. <laughs> that this uh, is a very this is very common, right? This is yeah. This is the the and and not to shame or or put the student down, but it's it's a very common mentality that I've been fighting years to break. Uh that, that student doctor network mentality of I have to have a four or I'm not gonna get into medical school. Yeah. Yeah, you're exactly right. And so the short answer to this student is no, do not retake that class. Uh, you're fine. Uh, it, if it comes up in, a, in an interview, for example, you can address it, mm -hmm. you know, talk a little bit about what was going on, you know, at the time or what, in that particular class or whatever. Uh, but with a 373 and an, even a 35, whatever, uh, for uh, the uh, BCPM, I, I think there's no reason to go back and take that class. Move on, get into upper level. Uh, sciences and stuff that's going to be much more valuable to you it's, yeah. it's going to tell a lot more to the admissions committees than going back and retaking calc, cal two. so yeah. yeah absolutely and just just to clarify for for other students who may not understand so retaking if if the recommendation was to retake this or where the student decided to to ignore scott and myself uh and retook calculus two it doesn't do anything to the c in the original Correct. calculus two class there's there's no replacing even if your undergrad replaces the grade on your transcript you still report that to the application services so, so it's still going to be calculated still calculated it doesn't change anything about that calculus two class there's no difference between retaking that calculus two and getting an A or taking anatomy and getting an A. At the end of the day, it does the same to your GPA. So I would just move on. It's 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 not one of those foundational classes that it's like, well, do you have the foundation? Do you need it to move forward? Um, and so definitely just move on. Now, if it was Okim two, <laughs> Okim two, yeah, I might suggest you retake it, but Cal two now. Yeah. Definitely. And the sad thing about calculus these days is that so many courses, uh, so many Cal courses are required of science majors at, at their university. So if you're a you know, chemistry major or even a biology major or biochem, uh, they're going to require calculus maybe even through Cal, Cal 2. The medical schools not I mean, used to be that that was a big deal for them. Yep. Uh, and a lot of it was because of the, the, in the old in the old school days, when you were calculating prescription values and stuff, you had to use calculus. To do that. <laughs> you don't have to do that anymore. Nope. And so they're much more interested in statistics as a as a foundation for the language of science these yep. days than than Cal is. And so, so definitely, uh, you know, if you have to take calculus for your degree plan, then so be it. But you you don't need it for there. There's very few medical schools that require calculus. I, I'm going to put on my cynical hat for a minute because that's just what I like to do. I, I think, I think if if we wanted to take a hard look at our undergraduate institutions, we could probably cut out a quarter to a third, if not a half, of the the random classes that we force students to take that that are probably still there to keep students in school for four years to take their money for four years and just let students get on with their life right take the classes you need to l to learn what you want to learn and move on yeah it's it's it goes back to the sort of you know um and, and i'll advocate somewhat this <laughs> this philosophy that it goes back to the notion that there's a difference between training and educating a thousand and percent so Training is, okay, I'm going to train you to do this task or I'm going to train you for this specific kind of job that you're going to get or whatever. 
as opposed to the sort of idea of liberally educating the mind. Mm. And that's where this comes from is, is the sort of traditional idea that requiring somebody to take, you know, history and English and uh, psychology and, and, and dabble in philosophy or other things, this sort of, the sort of elective idea of we want you to take a, a, a variety of things. It's this idea that they're trying to get you to, to think broadly, to think liberally, and to have those experiences. Uh, and, and this is a big uh, you know, philosophical debate in the, in the uh, world of higher education is, does that really exist anymore? Yeah. Does that still um, have a place in American higher ed? Uh, does it have a place for most students? Um, as a uh, liberal arts graduate myself, uh, I certainly think it taught me a lot. I didn't realize it at the time necessarily, but it taught me a lot about how to read, write, and think, which are crucial yeah. in, uh, in the world of uh, regardless of what kind of work you're doing. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you on some level, Ryan. On another level, I, I, I still see a benefit in, in taking these classes and, uh, and doing that. You know, if, if we just wanted to train you to do X, Y, and Z, then yeah, absolutely. We could, you know, we could send you to any, any training school to do that kind of stuff. It, it'll be interesting to see post COVID once, yeah. <laughs> whenever that is. Uh, th- yeah. There's some there's some estimates out there that that forty percent of of undergraduate institutions are going to go bankrupt and close with yeah, with everything going on. Smaller smaller uh, private schools. Yeah, yeah. agreed. So I, I think I think we're going to have a big push for non degree skills moving forward, and yeah, it'll it'll yeah. change change the landscape of education in this country. Probably right. Yep. We shall see, but not for pre-meds. <laughs> You're stuck here. <laughs> yeah. um, if you get a C minus in a course or a C in a general chemistry course, should you retake? My pre-med advisor stated any pre-med course with a C minus or lower should be retaken. Yeah, it must be basically for uh, for almost all schools. For the prerequisite. Yeah. Uh, so I think your pre-med advisor advisor is right on uh, with this advice. I think C minus or lower. Uh, they're not going to count. Uh, they're not going to allow them to count to, toward fulfilling that prerequisite. Uh, G and a, a C in general chemistry, absolutely, I would suggest retaking that, basically because it's such a foundational course for everything uh, that you're going to do in chemistry past that and on the MCAT. So if you don't have a good foundation in, in gen chem, that this could be a real problem. So yeah. absolutely agree with your advisor's uh, recommendation there. Yeah, it's not something we say often, but that's definitely a good one. So it just just to reframe that, right? It, for prereqs, for those kind of foundational prereqs that most schools still require, a C minus is basically an F. You you did not yep. quote unquote pass that class, and they want you to retake it. Um. All right. We have any other questions? Yeah, I think there's a couple of them. Ooh, I'm applying in 2021. Is it May or is May too late to take the MCAT? Should I take it earlier? Let's have a nice deep dive on the application timeline because this is something I think is important for students to understand, not just like what's required, but also like how life is just becoming chaotic around that time and students fail often to understand everything that they have to do. And then it's just like, uh, it just becomes overwhelming at some point. So, yep. right, May, all the application cycles open up. AMCAS, yep. TMDSAS, and ACOMAS all open up, usually within days of each other. And mm-hmm. uh, TMDSAS and ACOMAS, you can submit immediately. As soon as, right. as, soon as your application's ready. Uh, AMCAS, historically, you have to wait uh, until June 1st is the kind of historical... Uh, point for that. It's been late May lately. So that's that's when the applications open up and when you could submit. So if you took the MCAT in May, you get your score back. Let's assume it's back to the four-week turnaround for your score. Right now during COVID, it's two weeks. Let's, let's say May 1st, June 1st, you're getting your score back. So it depends on how comfortable you are with your MCAT score to determine if you are willing to 
quote unquote sacrifice some money to submit an application without knowing what your MCAT score will be. If on your practice test you're at like a 510, 515, you're like, I'm gonna crush it, it's not a problem, great, go ahead and apply, not gonna be a problem. If you're like 490, 495, you're not sure if you're gonna cross that 500 barrier, then maybe you wanna save your money and, and wait a little bit. Or you plan it out a little bit better and you take the MCAT a little bit earlier. Historically, I've always recommended, and, and Rachel can step in if, if she wants to as well, uh, his, the historical rec- recommendation that, that we've always given is April at the latest. So that gives you that month to get your score back and know your score when you apply. Now, there's there's some games to play around that, but but let's just put that on the back burner for now. The application involves a lot of things, right? It involves a personal statement. It involves all of the extracurricular activity writing. It involves secondary essays after you submit your primary application. It involves tracking down letters of recommendation, writers. It involves a lot of stuff. And typically what happens is students who delay the MCAT till later in the cycle usually are struggling with everything else, the personal statement writing, the extracurricular writing, uh, and a lot of times they're still in class too. And so now you're adding that on top of it. And, and it's usually just too much. And what usually gets sacrificed, hopefully, is the personal statement writing, the extracurricular writing. And so students who take a late MCAT around May are just starting to prepare their personal statements, their extracurriculars, everything else that goes along with an application then. And so now the whole application cycle gets pushed back and you're applying later and later and later. And so it's it's just in my mind, try, obviously best case scenario, try to get it out of the way earlier. If you can't, then try to balance everything so that you're working on everything a little bit all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the other part to that, Ryan, I think is, I think you're exactly right. Um, I think that um, the, the mass of things that you have to do uh, is extreme. And uh, if you can avoid having the MCAT as part of that mix, that would be great so that you're getting it out of the way before you have to embark on all the application stuff. The other thing that I, I think is important is, if you, if you compact that timeline too, too much and you end up coming in lower than you expected on the MCAT, then you may need to retake the MCAT. Yep. And that's going to limit the amount of time that you have to get that, that new, you know, to take it again and get that new score in in a, in a timely way in that cycle. <clears throat> so let's say you're scoring on the practice test 505, 57, maybe a 510 at the most. And you come in uh, with the real score, and it's a 498. Uh, you know you're going to want to retake that MCAT. Uh, and if you have limited yourself on that timeline, it's going to really squeeze you quite a bit. Plus the 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 additional prep time on the MCAT, you're you're trying to mix a whole lot of things in there. So I agree with you. I think taking it a little earlier than that, getting it out of the way, as you stated, is important. And then also for you know a potential retake if if that was necessary. Yeah, it gives you that that extra bit of buffer in there. And then and then something that if you go back and listen to some of my earlier podcasts, I, I was very down uh, on was the, the game that students play of applying only to one medical school to be able to submit their application and get it verified. Now, I, I've come around to like this because it, it gives students a little bit of a buffer. The students who who may not want to spend the money on more schools but are willing to sacrifice the $180, $200, whatever it is, to, to submit one school, get that in so that they can then focus on the MCAT, wait till their MCAT score comes back and go, okay, I'm, I'm clear and I'm verified. Let me add the other schools. Now, the one caveat that I'll put on this is you should, during the time that you take the MCAT, you're verified, you take the MCAT, between when you take the MCAT and when you get your score back, you should be, you should be pre-writing all of your secondaries as if 
you have already applied to those schools. Because assuming you get your score back and it's great, you're going to go add those schools. They're going to start kicking back secondaries to you almost immediately. <clears throat> so another thing students get caught with is they don't pre-write those secondaries. They add those schools, and now all of a sudden they have 400 essays they need to write. Yeah, yeah and, and just a, a bit of a, of a throw-in for TMDSAS, uh, much cheaper than AMCAS, Flat fee, so you don't have to worry about adding these core, you know, adding these other schools. You can just do it all at the beginning. Yep. It's a flat, flat 180 or whatever fee this year, and and you're done. Yep. So you don't have to, you know, play that kind of game with with Team DSS. Yeah, there's there's no reason that the other application services need to charge per school, um, but that's it a, doesn't make a whole nother discussion. It, it's a it's a total money thing. Because in terms of the work that you're doing, th there's no difference. It so is it doesn't really matter. just a money thing. Exactly. Yep. Unfortunately. Yeah. Sad. <sighs> Capitalism at its best. Right. <laughs> With shadowing and research opportunities being obviously canceled, have you guys heard anything from medical schools about the upcoming 2021 application cycle and alternatives to these in-person experiences so again a very common question right now with with everything going on with covid with life being canceled um the world the world being canceled how do we how do we still get clinical experience how do we still get shadowing if we're not allowed to leave our houses or go to these places to get yeah. these experiences um yeah. right we, we talked a lot about the the medical schools are, are facing very similar issues right with not being able to interview people with trying to figure out clinical rotations for their third year students, fourth year students, um, and, and all of that stuff going on. So they, I'd assume, right. They, they, they would obviously have to be understanding that, that this is happening and it's obviously not just you. Yeah. 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 And I think that, it, you know, a lot of my, my medical school friends in, in terms of the admissions world uh, are seeing how, um how this happens you know they're interviewing uh, virtually they're working uh virtually with their admissions committees their own students as you said ryan are most of their classes are being taken virtually yeah. uh and so they're they're very much in touch with the whole situation and uh and i you know if i had to guess uh i'm sorry to everybody listening to, to be such a, a Debbie Downer here, but uh, I think that don't say it's it. not going to get, don't, don't say it. No, <laughs> don't put it out in the universe. <laughs> I mean, I've heard way too many corporate people say that they're planning on the majority of 2021 being a virtual world. Yep. And uh, so I, I don't think this is going to change anytime between now and the next cycle opening up and, yep. and, and going, I, I, I'm sorry. I hate to say that it, 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 it hurts me as much as it de does you guys to hear that, but I don't think it's going to change anytime between now and next May. So I believe in science, Scott. I, I think, I think Dr. Fauci is going to save us with a vaccine yeah. that, that, that he's making in his basement right now. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think we're going to be down and out for a while, but, and, and, and just to follow up on that, because of that, right, we're going to have two years basically of of students who can't get clinical experience, online classes, um, very little volunteering, just lot, very little everything. Yeah. And medical schools are going to have to deal with that probably for the next five, six, seven years. Yeah. As as Great. these students who are going through the process now are applying and getting into medical school. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be in, in the, the the upside to this, I think, is it's going to be rich for research, for studying medical students and medical education and to look at is there a difference in the short run in medical school of these students who have limited experiences, who have had to do things virtually, who have interviewed virtually, and all of this stuff. And even in the long run, is there an impact on on their, their clinical interactions with patients in the last two years of med school in residency. Yep. You know, so there's going to be some very interesting stuff coming out of this uh, in terms of those people who research this kind of stuff yep. to see, do we really need to uh, 
have these types of requirements? Do we need to disadvantage students that have taken online uh, coursework? Do you, you know, there, there's going to be a lot coming out of this that's going to be very rich for people in the medical education world to study for years to come to see how the outcome of this cohort, these, these you know, two to three years of cohort, co cohorts of students, how they look and behave and, and, and perform in, in, the, in the clinical world. So. Yeah, These are the, totally. the best. I, I love uh, a podcast called Freakonomics. I don't know if you've ever mm -hmm. heard that podcast, oh, yeah. but they talk about these types of forced experiments, right? We The yeah. world was forced into this yeah. and and it's the perfect testing environment for an experiment to go, here's the cohort before, here's the cohort after, mm -hmm. <clears throat> right? This, this wasn't a personal choice. This is just the way it is. Reality. And so how 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 can we test that? So so talk about it from from your point of view, whether it's from your time as director of admissions at UT Southwestern or your time as executive director at TMDSAS. The the researchers in medical education that are researching that is are, are these questions that people are at the medical schools actively looking to answer these questions, or do they want to put their head down and go, it's been this way forever. It's okay. We're, let's just keep moving. No, I think, no, I don't think it's that way at all. I think, I think, um, medical education people in general and admissions people in particular are very interested in these topics. They're very interested in seeing how do we attract, because part of this is not just about how do we show, uh, how do we anticipate how well students are going to do in medical school, but it's also how do we recruit students to, to come to medical school, to get, to in, be interested in going into medicine as a career, mm. particularly students from disadvantaged backgrounds, from economically or socially or educationally disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, et cetera. Because so many times those students are the very students that we want to attract into the, into the process but we can't because we've got all these b barriers in the way. We've got all these hurdles that they have to go over, that they have to do this, that, and the other thing, and, and they can't work a full-time job and do this and do that and whatever. And so I think medical education people are very interested in this topic. Admissions people are hyper-interested in removing these kinds of barriers if they're not necessary. So I don't think it's an old-school mentality that says this is the way we've always done it and we're going to do it this way forever. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think it's that way at all. I think Good. the mentality is what can we do to attract people that we want uh, to serve us in the future? Uh, you know, these are good people. These are smart people. These are compassionate and empathetic people. We need them in our, in our, in our system of, of, uh, of health care. How do we attract them into it if we're going to continue to have these barriers? And so I, I think there's a, a real, uh, and, and I think, you know, knowing that we really reach out in this, in this uh, podcast and in these videos to a lot of non, non-traditional students, this is very applicable uh, to students who are in some other career that they're unhappy in, or they have always thought in the back of their head about, you know, I sure would love to go to medical school, but I just don't see it happening. Uh, I think there's a lot uh, here that could could really change the landscape a little bit for those types of students to make it easier for them to make this a reality. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I'm glad you think these people are are very empathetic and caring because the pre med the pre med community doesn't think of them that way. <laughs> yeah, and and I understand that but it's because of the mystery. Yeah. Uh, they, they really don't get to interact with them. They don't get to see them very often. They, they, uh, they, all they see is the barriers and the difficulties that, that they have to go through to get to get to a medical school. And so I, I, so I get that, but I think my experience has been that these are, these are, people are good people yeah. who really want to do the right thing, but they want to do it in a way that's going to guarantee that you don't have a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt and get kicked out of medical school. Yeah, uh, hopefully with with our kind of media approach of of really just creating content and having these interviews and and exposing kind of the behind yeah. the scenes as much as possible. Hopefully that yeah. gets better and better for students. Agreed. And Agreed. and and I think for medical schools, I, I think being more transparent will help the medical schools ultimately attract the students who they want. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. 
rocking and rolling. Does the admissions committee look closely at each transcript, such as how many credit hours I've taken every semester and what courses I took, or will they simply look at the GPA? It's a good question. I don't think we've we've gotten this one yeah. before, but it, it comes up a lot, right? Of uh, a student, especially a non traditional student who has uh, work and family to take care of, going back to school and taking like two classes a semester over the course of several years, and then is like, okay, I'm ready to apply to medical school versus someone who's a traditional student taking a full course load every semester. How how nitty gritty? And, and again you have a little bit of experience at one school as the director of admissions, a little bit of experience as executive executive director at TMDSAS, talking to all the schools. Yeah. And we, we can't speak for all the schools, but right. in general, how nitty gritty do you think medical schools get with looking at these transcripts? I think they get pretty nitty gritty. Uh, uh, the, the application services provide a whole bunch of da data uh, to the to the medical schools to look at applicants. They they chop that GPA up in a jillion different ways, semester by semester. They look at it non science and science semester by semester. They're looking at it uh, over the course of you know. It, this is what gives the medical schools the ability to see trends, uh, to see uh, courses that they've taken, and if. Uh, specific uh, um, number of hours in each semester, for example, like you just mentioned, Ryan. Uh, so they're really uh, able to look at the bigger picture of who is this applicant and their behavior as a student. Uh, so I think the medical schools get pretty pretty down and dirty with that, particularly with um, applicants that are what I would say is on the bubble. Uh, you know, there are some applicants where everything is super consistent you know, the, the, and, and it's it's a it's an applicant where uh, they don't really have to get too down and dirty because everything is is pretty looks all the same in terms of they you know they they're the traditional you know four years in college they've been full time student all the time they've done really well the whole time uh, and so the trends are all the same and so but when when a student has a more complicated application. Maybe they're a non-trad. Maybe they're a traditional student who's just having to work a lot during during school. So it's taking them five or six years to get through their undergraduate education. Um, they're going to look even close, more closely at those uh, applica applicants and and look at those trends and look at the situation that they that they've taken. You know, why did they take th this particular type of thing? And, and then they're going to look at why. Uh, what is the student said about that? in their application. Maybe, maybe there's an, a question in their secondary application about adversity and mm -hmm. what you've had to face and why you, you know, what you learned out of that adversity. And that's where you can really talk a lot about, I had to work 30 hours a week throughout college. I've had to take care of my, you know, ailing grandparents at home or whatever. And you can address that to sort of show the admissions committee that you're not just being a slacker and taking six hours a semester, or nine hours a semester, but you really are having to, to mix all of this stuff together to try to get it done. And so the short answer to the question is, I think admissions committees, um, in my in my experience, uh, I think really more so uh, as uh, the, the uh, executive director at TMDSAS, I really got a sense of the way these admissions uh, uh, committees look at, at, at all this stuff is, is why they say to the application services, we want to see the GPA chopped up in a thousand different ways. Uh, that's the reason that the the AMCAS and ACOMAS and TMDSAS do it that way. Yeah. And uh, so I, I think absolutely they look at stuff. They're not just asking you to put all this stuff in the application just to make it hard for you. Yeah. They want to know. And just just remember that what you see, you the student, what you see when you print your PDF is not what the medical schools see. The medical schools get a huge data dump of every data point, and based on the software that they're using to view it all, yeah. they have the ability to slice and dice and chop it up how they want, not yeah. how the AMC makes them look right. at something. Right. Yeah, absolutely. They're getting, I love that, that, uh, imagery of a data dump. <laughs> a data dump. Here, here's just all of this stuff. 
and uh, you do whatever you want to do with it <laughs> and figure it out. And, yep. and you're right. These, these admissions committees, these medical schools have uh, very good software products. Uh, I know some of the software products, some of them are homegrown, but a lot of them are crafted specifically for this purpose to, to give the admissions committees a really deep down dive on, on, uh, on this kind of stuff. So absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. When looking at the GPAs for schools that we want to apply to, should we solely use our undergraduate GPA or average undergraduate and graduate GPA to see how competitive we would be considered? Average. Comprender it. So, so they're, they're wondering. The should, overall. Yeah. Overall yeah. versus just graduate. Yeah. So my experience is they're going to get an overall GPA, which is going to include everything undergrad, grad, whatever. They're going to get an undergraduate GPA. Uh, they're going to get a graduate GPA. They're going to get a post back GPA. You know, as we said earlier, they're going to get that GPA carved up in, in really just hundreds of different ways. Yep. So when I think, I think what you need to do, if, if you're somebody who has graduate work, I would say, look at your undergraduate GPA um, first to determine, particularly if you're pretty close out of, out of school, um, that, that most of the medical schools that I'm familiar with are going to really center in. They're not as much going to look at that overall GPA, but they're going to center in on that undergrad GPA to give them a sense of what kind of student were you in undergraduate school. Mm -hmm. And then you can look secondarily at the graduate GPA, particularly if you were a post -bac who went into a graduate uh, post -bac program, that that GPA is in, their, in, in a graduate school GPA. Um, but I, I'd center in on the fir at, at, for a first review of where you might want to apply uh, on looking at the, the undergraduate GPA, your undergrad GPA related to what the averages are. Because most of those averages that are published by the, the medical schools are going to be an undergraduate GPA average. Yep. Yeah. And my general stance is that you shouldn't be applying based on GPA. So <laughs> right. I, w I won't give any more feedback on that answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I go against the grain for, uh, for applying to schools, but yeah, that is all right. I took anatomy and physiology and microbiology 10 years ago. Should I retake them? Wow. No, I don't think so. I, I think what you have to, what you have to realize in my view is that they may not impact your application because of that old, but I don't think you need to go back and retake them. I would, I would take other classes that you haven't yeah. had before, before I'd retake those classes, particularly if you can review the material, and, you know, maybe on your own and kind of refresh yourself on those types of things. Uh, but no, I, I don't think it'd be yeah. advisable to retake them. Those and those those aren't foundational courses for Correct. the MCAT. I mean, there there is some anatomy and physiology on the MCAT, but those aren't foundational courses uh, or prereqs right. for the majority of schools. There there are a handful of schools that have uh, A and P as a as a prereq, but that's few and far yeah. between. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you should retake them. Nope. Go enjoy something else. Is there a way to audit a medical school course as a pre med or non traditional pre med? Zoom bombing. <laughs> yeah. now, now with virtual yeah. courses, just Zoom bomb them. <laughs> yeah. See, uh, see if you can get a link from a buddy. <laughs> yeah, the answer is no. You can't, you can't do that. Oh, you're no fun. I know. Sorry. <laughs> let's, I mean, be nice let's talk good, tradi but... traditional times. Um, how common yeah. is it for a student to call up and say, hey, I'd, I'd love to come audit a course like or audit a day and, and just hang out? Is that something that's common? No, yeah. no. I, I, in my ten years at Southwestern, I, we probably encountered that less than five times. Yeah, yeah. It, it, this very uncommon. Yeah, uh, the the time to audit a course usually is when you're there on interview day. A lot of times they yeah. let you go in and hang yeah, out. Yeah, sit a in on minutes. course. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. That's right. But generally speaking, no, you can't do that. Yeah. 
unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it'd be nice. And, and and maybe again with with COVID and with technology changing as rapidly yeah, as it's, it's changing, yeah, it's changing and, and being adapted, why why not? Right when we even when we go back to a classroom environment, being able to to set up uh, cameras and webcams and being able to zoom into a course, I, I think I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, and you know, there's there's. It's it's not as common these days as it used to be that medical schools even require lectures. Yep. So you know they're already they're already filming the lectures. The students are you know I had a, I had a, a number of students that at Southwestern who uh, would um, listen to the, the lectures on like time and a half. Oh yeah. So they're working out <laughs> or something, and and then they slow it down or they they rewind it and listen if they miss something or if they they're not comfortable with what they heard yep. then they'll slow it down to, to to the regular speed but they'll they'll, they'll speed through that because <laughs> they're trying to get a sense of what what's the important thing here yep. that i'm really needing to connect with and uh and and, and really f- uh, focus in on those things as opposed to ancillary stuff that is interesting but not as you know not as crucial to what i need yeah. to know our our brain it's it's funny so i i listen to podcasts uh usually around like 1.7 times mm-hmm. our brain can process that not a problem so right it, we right. we can process and then I, then i hear someone talking normally and i'm like why are you speaking so slowly yeah. <laughs> i i tried i i tried to watch <laughs> tv shows sped up but I, I couldn't do tv shows just don't they don't work sped up but yeah. youtube videos i'll watch sped up as well um i, I just I, I have a plugin in my in my browser so this is a little a little trick i i have a plugin called uh what's this plugin called video speed controller for chrome and it's just it puts a little overlay on every single video and i can speed up or slow down any video um it's super nice you're such a geek I just, it just helps me consume more stuff so I can be smarter than you. Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm trying. Hello. I'm getting there. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm getting hello. there. <laughs> I'm, I just got pushed to the floor there. No, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not, I'm not there yet. I have to get there. <laughs> I'm doing this to catch up. <laughs> Uh, there's a med school that has about 12 secondary essays with 500 max words each. If the quality of the essay is good, do you think that they would see it lazy to have each essay around 300? This is another one of those like pre-med myths of like, I have to fill it out or else it's yeah. not good enough. Say what you're going to say and get on with it. You know, that's <laughs> what I say. They're not going to count. They're not, in my experience is they're not going to word count and then their software that they're using to evaluate uh, is not word counting. They're yep. just trying to say what your answer is. You know, yep. they just want the answer to their. Now, having said that, what the hell's wrong with this medical school that they need twelve essays, 12 essays. on their secondary? Yeah, I mean, it's three. it's either Duke. I don't think it's Carl. Carl at Island think has that many. Duke has a ton. Um, I I want to know if if you're still watching this, what what school is it? Um, Duke has a ton. I'm trying to think of the other ones that that really have a ton. I think USC, UCLA potentially have a ton. Um, yeah. But Duke is the one. Every time I see that every year, I'm like, oh lord, here we go. Yeah, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Buckle up. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, you know, I would say just <clears throat> answer it as best you can and. Don't don't uh, count too much yep. word count and stuff. Just put in there what you feel like your answer is, and just yep. move on. It's the same answer I get for for interview questions, right? How long is yeah. a good interview answer? I'm like, the answer needs to be as long as it needs to be, and no longer. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, agreed. No fluff. Yeah, that's right. <sighs> oh, it's, she says it's the University of Louisville. Oh, Louisville. All right, Louisville. Louisville. Wonder if they ask about Brianna Taylor. They should. They should ask about Brianna Taylor there. Yeah. Right. <sighs> All right. Uh, I have seen that schools recommend completing prereq courses within five years. If you took the majority of prereqs, let's say six years ago, but took a few classes that are also prereqs three years ago, do admissions committees go by the earlier or later date of completion? This is one of those pre-med expiration questions. Yeah. You know, 
So let me see. If you took the majority of prereqs, let's say six years ago, but took a few classes that are also prereqs three years ago, took about the earlier or the later date of completion. So I, I'm, that's what I'm getting stuck on is by the earlier or later date of completion. Are some of these retakes then? Probably I, not retakes, but they're saying, is, is it good enough if I'm taking it within the window to show that I'm still good at classes? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't get too too focused in on that. I mean, the MCAT's going to be a big thing for students who are that far out yeah. from uh, the coursework. So I think that, um, you know, the, the honest truth is on a student like that who are, you know, five or six years out from most of their pre classes, yep. if they come in with a, you know, 510, 512 uh, MCAT score, I, I think it's less of an issue. Yeah. Uh, if they come in with a 501 uh, MCAT or, you know, 495, then it's, it's going to be a big issue. But the med school is yep. going to say, well, they're so far away from a lot of that material that they, they're just not, they weren't capable of, you know, handling the, the, the prep for the MCAT uh, in such a way that, that gave them the ability to, to, to remember all of it, et cetera. So I think the MCAT becomes pretty important with that. Yeah. Um, a lot, another quality that they're going to look at is what have you been doing since then? Mm -hmm. If you haven't been in school, that makes a lot of, uh, at least some um, medical school admissions officers a little concerned. Mm -hmm. If it's been, you know, two, three, four years since you've actually been a student, uh, then that can be a little bit of a a little bit of a concern for student for uh, med school admissions people, um, but it, again, it kind of depends on how good of a student you were before, what your GPA looks like, what the classes are that you're taking, what your MCAT score looks like. Um, so there's a lot of pieces to that puzzle that are going to dictate how that question you know sort of gets answered. I think. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And and for the the few schools and it is probably very few schools that actually have that in writing in terms of prereqs within five years mm -hmm. if, if if you're questioning that is it six years in in my mind if a school specifically says we want your prereqs within five years and yours are six years ago they may have an issue with that so just reach out to them and say here's where i'm at and they may go oh yeah that's yeah. fine 